Hey there, everybody. It's Irene Lyon here. It is the, gosh, I don't even know what day it is. It's the 21st of January. It is the year 2021. And as I wait for a few folks to pop in here. I am going to just make sure everything is going well in my settings here. Oops. There we go. All right. So if you are here, if you're listening live, send me a comment so I can see that you are finding me and hearing me loud and clearly. I'm going to assume you are. I can see about 31 people so far on the line. So I'm going to wait for a moment as we get a few more. You may be watching this on YouTube because we take these videos and we push them over to YouTube. It will stay live here. Um, so if you're on YouTube, thank you for pressing play on YouTube. I know it can be a little more of a commitment to push play on something that's more than, I don't know, 45 an hour long. Uh, thanks, uh, Elizabeth and Jesse, for letting me know that you can hear me. And um, gosh, it is the new year and there's a lot going on right now with um, offerings that I have for you that my team and I are preparing. Um, and I will take a moment while we get more people on to just give you an update. So first of all, number one, if you are not on my email list, I know I say this like a broken record, but it is, in my opinion, uber important to get on that list because I don't know if these social platforms are going to survive and it would really suck if um, I don't have a way to communicate with you. And email is still kind of king and queen. So every week, without fail, on Monday, we send out an email with either a new piece of content, an old piece of content we've brushed up, maybe a reminder about um, some learning that I want to make sure you don't forget about. Um, and then, of course, when we have other offerings like drop-in class, so for example, my monthly drop-in class, this is a paid class, $19, is happening this Saturday, the 23rd of January from 12 to 1 p.m. And we're going to be focusing on the regular themes of nervous system health, the basics, so orienting, following impulse, connecting to the ground, um, connecting to the environment, connecting to just what is there in the moment and following that, but I'll also be blending in the importance of expressing our animal self. So the mammalian part of us really needs to shine as well as the human part. And I'm gonna get into that today. This, come, this is where higher states of consciousness come in. This is where being able to observe our survival mechanisms popping up. And it's really kind of, the linchpin, if you will, this ability to bring together the animal expression, the mammalian expression, and also the human intelligence, if you will. Not that animals aren't intelligent, but I got to find a way to differentiate the two, right? So um, class on Saturday, we're going to be, we're not going to go into massive amounts of cathartic stuff. I don't do that, but we'll be playing with expression, with social engagement. Um, and just feeling what it's like to tap into some of the primal mammalian emotions. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, my helper Crystal will probably put in a little link here for drop-in class. Again, it's $19. It's an hour long from 12 p.m. Pacific to 1 p.m. Pacific. We do it on Zoom. We record it, audio, video. We send you the recording afterwards. So if you can't make it live, you can still take in the resource and the replay. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. I see we have 66 people here, so thanks everybody. I'm just gonna read out some of the things here. Let's see, we've got the UK and South Africa. Yeah, let me know where you are. Ireland, um, thank you, thank you. Awesome. So that's the first thing. The second thing, um, at the beginning of each year, and this has been kind of going on for at least five years now, we get ready for my 12-week program, Smart Body, Smart Mind, dubbed SBSM. And this has been going on for quite a few years. This will be the 10th time that we run Smart Body, Smart Mind. So it's crazy to think we've run this session, this program 10 times. We've had people from over 60 countries go through it, all walks of life. I was just talking to someone the other day who was like, who is this program for? Um, you know, is there a type of person that shouldn't do it? And really it comes down to obviously you, your desire, 
to heal, to become your own medicine, your desire to be deserving of good, full, vital health. I'll be getting into that today on this special topic on sovereign source energy, life force energy. Um, but Smart Body, Smart Mind is just a fabulous way to invest and to commit to a practice. And we need to practice. If we just do things when we feel like it, if we um, only do theory, and theory is super important, there is a lot of theory, way more than what you're gonna get in these um, informal lectures. There's a lot of theory, there's a lot of neurosensory practice, that's my way of saying connecting to the nervous system, the senses, the environments, the environment. Um, there's also a lot of extra resources in there, there's support from my team, and we go for 12 weeks. So this year, here are the dates, we will open up registration on the 22nd of February and we close on the 7th of March and we begin with orientation week on March 8th. We have a week of orientation, which is just getting your bearings, kind of like if you're at university, learning where things are, or college, if you're in the States, and then we get into the work and there are 10 modules, we call them labs. Each lab has four lessons and while I suggest a path for doing the labs and lessons, it's still a follow your impulse, go at your own pace program. We are live together for 12 weeks. There are Q and A calls. There are live lectures like this on Zoom with me live. They're not pre-recorded. Um, we do live Q and A sessions, myself and my husband, Seth, we share those. And then we have a team of amazing people who are all trained in SE um, from all sorts of disciplines and areas of mind, body work, psychology work who help moderate the comments and the questions. So I'm giving a little bit of a, a promo hit for this now because I wanna make sure that you don't, if that you know about it, because we sometimes have people, once we close registration for the year, because we only do this once a year, we won't be opening up registration until most likely next year, at least that's the plan. Um, a lot of people will say, oh my God, I didn't know that this was happening. So I'm here to say it is happening. We're running it. Um, and I'm looking forward to this session. It was a powerful session last year. We had our best session yet. We had so, so many people in it, learning, healing. I think because of the situation in the world, people were more focused. They really wanted to work on themselves because here's the thing, let's face it, we can't always control our environment, but if we know how to be with ourselves, be internal and know how to guide our sensations and emotions and feelings and traumas in a way that is very solid, resilient, regulated with this higher conscious observer mentality, being with that biology that I mentioned a second ago that that mammalian biology, we got a lot to play with, right? And it's kind of an ongoing lifelong process. So definitely um, check that out. And then the final thing I'll say, and then I'll get into today's topic is um, if you haven't yet started the Healing Trauma video series, this is a series I've, I've had going for, again, just as long as Smart Body, Smart Mind has been going. We redid the videos two years ago, three videos, they get into what survival stress is, I talk with story and analogy, which is my thing. Um, I get into some of the science, some of the research around the nervous system. And I talk about the importance, and this is very important. If you haven't heard this yet, perk up, write it down. Neuroplastic healing sequencing. I'm gonna say that one more time. Neuroplastic healing sequencing. And of course, because I'm an educator, I gotta tell you a little bit more about that. Neuroplasticity is the capacity for our system. A lot of people say brain, but it's not just the brain, it's all of us. It's the capacity for all of us to change and shift. It can be a negative thing or it can be a positive thing. Neuroplasticity is what gives us our bad behaviors, our behaviors that harm us, things like addiction, that need for something to keep us contained and going. But it's also what helps somebody recover from a stroke and learn how to walk again. It's what allows us as human beings to learn how to write. I'm still every now and again, I know we don't write a lot, at least I don't, but I enjoy writing a little bit at least every day. And when I look at writing, it amazes me that at one point in my life, I couldn't do that. 
At one point in my life, I broke my arm when I was five and I had to relearn how to write, even though I was young, with my left hand, right? And so our capacity to grow and change and wire and unwire and rewire is quite immense. And when we have the right sequencing in place, this is what makes things shift. So if you do take some time to read and watch some of our stories from our alum who went through SBSM, a lot of people will say, this sounds too good to be true. And here's the thing, it's not. It's because of how I've structured the course, the methodologies and the modalities and the science and the practices that are in it, it lines up so that you're learning how to heal at this somatic level in the right order. So um, there's my, my um, quick promo for SBSM. It's very important for me that you know about this because I don't like rushing people into the decision. I don't want you to find out about it the day before we close registration. Then you have to make a decision based on survival. Take some time over the next few weeks to get into those healing trauma videos. They are complimentary. Take some time to read and watch the stories of our alum and really feel into your own self as to whether or not this is something you want to commit to, invest in, and do. So thanks for listening to that. I'm going to have a little sip of tea and then we'll get going. So the, the topic today, and I will do some q and A. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this tight and, and shorter, and then we'll get into some questions from you on this topic. It's sovereign source energy. This is a word that I never really thought about until kind of the last 10 months, but it's life force energy. It's something that I have been knowing about and teaching and working with on with myself and obviously with my students for a long time but there was something about this word sovereign that really infused into me the past year and i did look up the definition of it and there's lots of definitions but some of the key pieces and i got my notes here so i don't forget is having kind of supreme authority over self and while sometimes that word authority can be triggering for some, we want to be our own authors, our own authority. We want to live our lives based on us. And while I tend to not guide you through a lot of somatic stuff in these live lectures, take a second to actually take your hand and just be like, this is me. And really mean it. This is not going to be new for my students who are here because I know there are some I'm, I'm recognizing names. But even if you are an old pro at this work, I still do this sometimes. This is me. And it's not, doesn't have to be on this area. It could be the leg. It could be the arm. It could be the head. But just to make a somatic connection, this is me. This is my system. This is myself. And to really start to ask yourself the question, uh, am I, are you aware that you have the capacity and have the birthright to dictate yourself? I'm going to give some examples as to how this might get thrown off when we're young, right? So this ability to know that you actually have the ability to, to know who you are and to have this innate essence that is in your system. Now, I might be sounding a little cryptic here, but that's kind of the, the fundamental piece to being sovereign, having life force energy. Some might argue that they're slightly different, and maybe they are if we like scrutinize the definitions and the root words, but I'm not going to get into that. It comes down to personal force, power within your own self. The other thing that I will talk about today is the importance of following impulse and following your biology. And the reason why that is really important, in my opinion, is because often when we're really young, it's our biology that gets shut down first. And now I'm not talking about, at this point, inter-past generational traumas that we're carrying from our ancestry, from in utero into this day. I'm talking about from when we come out of mama and we have expression, and let's just say that expression doesn't get to be fully expressed and um, acknowledged and respected. So I will give another example of that in a moment. So first of all, this I'm kind of going through the list. 
this innate knowing that we have got um, a knowing of what you need for you. So that's let's let's name it that what you need for you. And some of us have lived lives where we're constantly doing for others, which is important, but we have to also be selfish in order to be selfless. I've heard this over and over again in different ways and in different places, but the more and more I learn and age and teach, we have to be selfish in order to take care of not only others, but ourselves. And so that's the first thing. The second thing, biology, being able to follow, follow our biology, honor it. And here's the thing, when we don't follow and honor our biology, this is what makes us sick, unwell, not in connection with ourselves. The other thing, or the next thing, the third one, and I don't like numbering things because one isn't more important than the other. So the next thing would be honoring and knowing that healthy aggression and anger as an emotion is super duper important. Um, the other day I, I had an email exchange with someone and and I won't go into the details, but basically they said point blank, I don't have any anything to do with anger. I know I don't have any stored anger. No, no, not nothing like that. And here's the thing. Usually when someone says point blank, yeah, I got no anger issues. There's nothing in there. I beg to differ that. And someone might be saying, well, Irene, maybe they know what's good for them. And, and yes, that's true. And I have not come across one person, not yet, who doesn't have some form of stored anger, healthy aggression, even rage rage in their body because of some kind of thing that occurred to them when they were young, when they were a teenager, when they were an adult, um, all these things. And healthy aggression is super important. It doesn't have to be because someone wronged us. It can just be that life force energy. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then the third thing or the fourth thing or the, the number four point that isn't really number four because they aren't in order is do you have some kind of connection to some kind of higher source? And I'm always very cautious about this because this doesn't necessarily mean a God source. It can be the earth source. It could be mother nature. It could be the big bang theory and some kind of cosmological force that created what is here now. There's no, in my opinion, right or wrong to how a person connects to that. I love Star Wars. If you've been following me for a while, you know that to me, that's a force, that force that they talk about that's just all around us, that, that connects us, that binds us. We could say that's a higher level of um, consciousness, a collective consciousness, right? This ability for us to know that we are collective, that we are community, but, and this is where it gets tricky, we're also individuals. And I think because of that, I think I know pretty darn well because of this higher brain and our insane creativity and unique capacities as humans, we're all different. We all have fingerprints that are different. We all were raised slightly differently. Our parents were raised differently. We're not like a herd of cattle, right? Or a pack of wolves in the, you know, in the, the forest. Humans are really different than mammal packs that travel and are in their own versions of community. We have that physiology, but we also have this very interesting ability with our consciousness, which is a technology essentially, right? Our ability to change things with our mind, to create drama when it's not there or to heal trauma that is there. Right, so we've got this ability to use this higher brain to guide our biology so that we can be fully healthy and vital and empowered. This hasn't been the story for humanity. And so now that we have the science or we're learning about the biology through science, through research, we have the practices. If you were here at the beginning of this live stream, I talked about my program, Smart Body, Smart Mind, and how that practice We've been doing it enough to know, and I'm like, this works. If you do the work and you go through the program and the way that we've outlined it, and you really follow your biology, follow your impulse, you're there for you, not because someone made you do it. Good things happen, right? Good things happen. Um, 
I had a thought that came in and now it's gone, so hopefully it'll come back. Um, I'm just going to go into the comments here just to acknowledge any other notes that people might have popped in. Hello from Estonia. Hello from DC. Hello from Illinois. And then if you are here live, we've popped the links to the healing trauma videos in here. Um, so if you haven't yet started, uh, sign up for that and get started on those today. Um, hello from Whidbey Island, that's just south of here. Hello from New Zealand, that's far away from here. Um, hey, Melissa, glad that you did the program and you loved it. Um, all right, all right. Louise, thank you for your comment. You say, I would love and appreciate so much of people who have done SBSM could write me. I'd love to hear more about it from you. We really prefer that people not direct message folks unless you've given them permission. So you kind of have given permission, Louise or Louis. Um, head to our site and read the testimonials. And there are dozens of videos. We've curated those with permission from our students. So start with those and listen. If they're all genuine accounts of people's stories. They're not just two sentences. This was amazing. A lot of them are longer stories. Um, gets into where a person was, what they learned. Even in my videos, I ask my students, what was the ch what were the challenges? Were there challenges in your family system? And a lot of them will say yes, right? A lot of them will say yes, but that's part of this work. Okay. Uh, hey, Lindsay, thank you. You say it's a brilliant program, keeps giving. Yes, it does. That's the other thing. SPSM is not something that you start and finish and then you're done. This is something that is continually going to infuse your life. Granted, you want it to. The lessons are yours for life. The program site is yours for life. Granted, we continue to have an internet. You know, anything could happen. Um, but you're there in the program, connected to it indefinitely. And when we run the program again in future, you get to come back as an alumni and participate free of charge. All right, Nova Scotia is in the house. Seattle, Belgium, Vancouver. And yes, right now we are doing um, some research. So we partnered up with the lab. And don't worry, you guys, I'll get back into my notes for today's lecture. Um, uh, we've done a, a partnership with a research lab, a neuroscience lab out of Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And they are um, going to track and study um, a group of people who are about to go through Smart Body, Smart Mind starting in March and we end in June. And they're gonna just measure, survey them with how they are, how they've changed, uh, things that they notice are different about their perception of their internal internal environment. This is something called introception. Um, that's really basically um, what it is. There's not much more to say. Um, we closed registration for the study in December. So right now we have the, the cohort that we're going to follow. I don't know who those people are. If you are one of those people, do not tell me. I'm not supposed to know. But that lab is not my business. So we've partnered with them. They are doing the research. They are the academics. And we are going to run the program and be the practitioners who guide you through the program. So they're two separate things. Even though I have a history and a background in research and academia, um, I prefer doing this. I prefer teaching. I prefer being creative and writing and making videos. I realized that statistics and research science wasn't my jam, even though I appreciate and respect it so much. It just wasn't for me. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Sambal. Hey there from Denmark. Hello from Pakistan. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. Um, uh, Ireland. Yes. Freya, I'm going to read your comment and then I'm going to get back into sovereign source energy. So Freya says, I had no idea I had stored anger, even doing smart body, smart mind. So this is one of our alum. And I didn't think it was an issue for me. So it's been fascinating to discover. Oh, comments are coming in fast. So it's been fascinating, fascinating to discover I have and how to work with it has been so healing. Yes. Um, and Caitlin, I will answer your question about the 21 day tune up in a moment, but I want to address this anger thing um, because it's really, really important. So I'm going to go back to that list of things that I was talking about. One of them was the importance of healthy aggression, anger and recognizing our rage. And um, I'm going to read something 
because I like reading things sometimes. Hello to all the 90 people here. I'm going to have some more tea. All right. This is from a wonderful book called The Essential Edgar Cayce. Um, if you have never had a, if you've not learned with me, this might be a new person. This person is long past. He died in 1945. He was a psychic prophet who had healing capabilities. His history is amazing. Um, and he was one of the first fathers of holistic medicine in kind of our North American Western world. And um, he healed a lot of people and nobody could figure out how he did it because he did it when he was um, in a trance and he could diagnose anything and pretty much every single remedy he gave worked. And people, I have to tell you a little history, people tried to discredit him. He was put in prison um, for practicing medicine without a license. You gotta understand this was the, like the late, the early 1900s or the, you know, like in the very beginnings of 1900. So this was weird back then. But what he was connecting to, if you get to his work and you read, he was connecting to something called the Akashic Records. He was connecting to a collective consciousness. He was, he was connecting to an essence, a source energy. He was very Christian. I am not in that way, but he was, and I respect that. So he was very connected to a source, a higher source. He would call it God. Um, but he was able to find in people's biologies things that he was not trained as. He was a photographer, but he knew without having learned medicine, every single medical term, biological term, anatomical term, and anger was one of the things he talked about. So this isn't, this is someone talking about him, um, someone who studied him and his talk on anger. So, or one of his examples on anger. So. Um, another example is Casey's admonition of just how important it is to be able to get angry. Anger is an emotion directly related to saying no. I'm going to pause on that for a moment. No. Boundaries, right? Consent. Not for me. I don't want that. Those sorts of things. Of course, those are my words, not the book's words. So I'll go on. Of course, he isn't saying we need to run around blowing our stacks every day, but he did emphasize the need to express anger in the right way. And then I quote Casey, be angry, but sin not for he that never is angry is worth little. I'm going to say that one more time. Be angry, but sin not. So basically be angry, but don't harm someone. Right? So if you're angry because of something that occurred or maybe your child just spilt something or broke a glass, and we'll get into this whole how we treat children and allow them to keep their sovereign source life energy. But if little one breaks a glass, you know, and it's a mistake, because it usually is, even if they're raging, there's a reason they're raging breaking that glass. But let's just say little one breaks a glass there's nothing wrong with getting angry, but get angry internally, process it afterwards. So in other words, sin not basically means don't harm another person because of your internal emotions that you need to contain. So, but then Casey adds how important it is to have a container, took the words out of my mouth, to have a container for that anger. And I quote, but he that is angry and controlleth it not is worthless. I know that's a little harsh, but it's true. Basically, he's saying if someone is angry and they don't know how to control it, that ain't good, right? So then the author says, note here that control does not mean suppression. Control does not be, mean suppression, but proper direction, and it's a crucial distinction. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, when we suppress anger, and we know this, if you want a bunch of resources and journal articles, go to Gabor Mate's book, When the Body Says No. He has really unpacked the harm of holding in and suppressing anger, especially anger, and how that creates toxicity in the internal environment of our body. Because anger and healthy aggression, mm, you know what the word valence means? 
chemistry. It's a it's a term for a, for um, the strength of something. Anger has a high valence in terms of the mammalian emotions. It's got big energy, right? It's got big energy. It's something that could kill someone if we needed to act in self-defense, right? Which is sometimes needed. Um, and it's also the energy that pushes us, push us, pushes us, pushes, I can't say that, that will push us through when we are frustrated with something. But we need to use sometimes frustration and irritation to have us complete a task, let's say, right? As opposed to collapsing and shutting down when something is overwhelming. So this ability to direct anger in the right direction is super important. So I wanted to read that. For those of you that are interested, this is called The Essential Casey um, by Mark Thurston. I don't know if you can see that. Um, page 31. Okay, so I wanted to write, read that just because there has been kind of this myth that anger is bad, that if you are ascended and if you are enlightened, you are not going to get angry and you are not going to get pissed off at something, and that is just false. The key is, is, is that anger, as he said, creating violence? He used the word sin, but, you know, we know what that means. Um, is it creating more hurt, more trauma? Or can the anger move out and up in a way that actually frees up our capacity? So I'm going to tell a, a short story that was talked about in another vlog of mine, and Crystal can put that up here for people that want reference. Um, I did a vlog back in the summer, I think, on what is healthy aggression. And so this is where I'm going to go into how as little ones, as children, our sovereign source, life force energy gets squashed, right? It gets stomped on. So I'm going to also make some generalizations here, okay? So let's just say a newborn baby comes out and they're healthy. They're full term. There's no medical trauma. There's no birth trauma. I know that's not always the case, but let's just say baby is good enough, comes out, lungs are working, cardiovascular system's working, and parents are pretty good, right? They're not, they're not neglecting the child, they're attaching to them, they're secure with them. Um, mom and dad like each other, you know, the, the, the family system, the family unit is solid and healthy. Um, heck, breastfeeding, all of it is great, hunky-dory. But let's just say the moment that baby gets to a certain age, and they're all a little different because they all grow at different paces, but there's a point at which um, a little human will start to feel their life force energy, their strength, and they will do things, especially if you have long hair like me, if you're, can't, if you're holding one or if a mama is nursing, they'll start pulling or they'll start punching or they'll start scratching or they'll, 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 they're, they're feeling their limbs that are starting to come online in a more sympathetic, active, motor sensory way, right? Newborn baby comes out, there's a lot going on there, but they are not active athletes yet. They're pretty, they're intelligent, and there's a lot going on, but they don't have a lot of fine motor skill, right? That's the word I was looking for. Their cognition isn't on board. They're pre-verbal but they feel everything. And so let's just say baby starts pulling on hair or scratching or hitting or whatever it is. And let's say baby scratches mom's face or dad's face, doesn't have to be mother, could be nanny, it could be auntie. And the, the, the parent is shocked because they just were harmed by little one. I'll give you this question. Do you think that that little one is purposely trying to be violent and harm the person who's caring for them. Let me know in the comments. Let's just let that linger as I have a, a sip of coffee here. What do you think? Or a little one finds mom's beautiful hair and she starts pulling on it. Do you think that is, do you th I think there's a delay here. Do you think that's done maliciously? And do you think that's done intentionally trying to harm the person who's caring for a little baby? Yeah, 
I think it, it's kind of a, a kind. It's sort of kind of weird, right? I'm pausing on this, and it, there's a definitely a delay here. So of course not. You all know this. Anyone with empathy knows. No, the little one is not. Of course not. Of course not. Is there any question? <laughs> yeah, right. So they're not trying to harm. And here's the thing. A lot of times, and again, I'm generalizing, got to protect my butt here. If the mother, caregiver, auntie, whatever, babysitter doesn't understand that higher consciousness observational fact, they might say, how dare you? Don't, don't scratch mummy. We don't hurt people. And I, I've watched videos and I've kind of dug into the, the annals of the you know, online media. And um, a lot of people will be like, yeah, we don't, we don't let our children hurt us. If they hurt us, if our babies scratch us, we, we tell them that that's not okay. And here's the thing, at that age, no. They are expressing their healthy aggression. Um, if you're five or six or seven or eight or 10 or heck 45 and I maliciously hit someone, that's not okay, right? Unless of course someone's attacking me and I'm trying to get them off, right? But at that age, they are finding what's called, what's called their healthy aggression. So if that little one is put down, is scolded, even though they don't understand cognitively, don't do that, don't hurt mummy, don't hurt me, we don't hurt people. Even if that one doesn't understand, they'll feel the energy. They'll feel the reverb of that, you just did something bad and you should be ashamed of yourself. This is the very first beginning, very first beginning of that little one deflating a little bit. And then it usually continues or they're put down, right? Little mom, I mean, this, these, I learned this through Peter Levine, this work, and some of my other older mentors who are well into their, gosh, 80s now, right? So this little monster just harmed me, so I'm just going to put her in isolation, going to punish her. So this is the start of how we muck that up. So true story, a friend of mine, acquaintance, had a newborn, this was ages ago, and little one was, I can't remember if he was hitting or, or pulling her hair and she said um, she went to the internet to see what to do if your baby hits you and the internet said hit the baby back I'm not making that up true story and I was like yeah don't do that and so she was like well what what do I do and here's the thing this mother loved her baby healthy person regulated relationship I know her family they're great people even she didn't know what to do why that is, I don't know, it's not her fault, but this comes back to, I could say maybe I do know what it is, if we are not connected to this sovereign, internal, innate knowing, we will be um, in miscommunication with that little one and ourselves. So what I said was, try this next time he pulls or he punches take the hand or take the little fist or whatever with gentleness but with force and say to them you are so strong let's play a game right right rather than scolding and hitting back or being like i don't know what to do with this and going into your own set of shock actually let yourself play with that energy well, let's play let's let's fight but in a good way right think about dogs Cats. If you've ever had two dogs or two cats together, usually not dog and cat, but two dogs, two cats, they get into a play fight that is very aggressive, but it's not because they're trying to harm each other. They're getting their life force energy, their animal energy out, and it's very healthy for them. And so humans are the same way. Kids need to rough and tumble. Babies need to be able to pull and squeeze. And often we'll say, oh, look at how strong she is. And like, you're so strong. It's like, yeah, that's what you want to do. You're so strong. So to go back to um, what I mentioned a second ago and someone said to me, yeah, I don't have any anger. I beg to differ. Most of us at some point in time have had our, our healthy aggression, our anger, stunted, depressed, um, 
squashed down. And here's the thing, working with it and learning how to work with it requires time and it requires capacity building. Just like my students said about 10 minutes ago, I didn't know that I had so much anger in me. And here's the thing, if we have been walking around in a very functionally frozen state, I did another video about this, I'm not gonna get into this or else we'll be here for two hours. Watch that video on functional freeze. I go through a very important vignette of how functional freeze starts um, or can start. If we're walking around in a functionally frozen state and someone says, come on, just get angry, you know, just express yourself. And a person goes, oh, okay, um, do I just shake my fists like this? Do I pound? I don't know what to do. Do I, ah, do I scream? And hopefully you're seeing that I'm acting here. I'm trying to be funny, but not. We can't pretend to be angry. We can't pretend to move this bolus of life force energy up and out. It has to come naturally. We want it to come organically because if it's not organic and if it's not connected to the capacity in our system, that life force energy isn't going to give us or I should say that expression of anger, healthy aggression is not gonna give us the healing juju that we want. So to come back to that a little bit, it's very important to understand most of us probably are sitting on a bed of hot coals somewhere in our system that is carrying that anger, healthy aggression energy. It might even have what we would call annihilation energy. And that is a type of energy that is very powerful and very big. And when we've been harmed in many ways or repeatedly, and I mean, there's many reasons why people are harmed. It could be actual abuse. It could be um, surgical trauma where we're being poked and prodded and we didn't want to, but we had to stay still to save our lives. But we want to rage and hit those people away from us. It could be that. Or it could be in utero um, trauma where we are wanting to get out of the womb because mom is dousing us with stress chemicals because she is unhappy, she is unwell, but we are in a situation of inescapable attack. When we are in utero and we're being hit with cortisol and stress and her emotional distress and we, like, a kid can't get out of there. And that's why I believe miscarriages happen. It's not the only reason, and protect myself there, but if a baby senses, if a little one senses this isn't safe, I'm getting hit with too many chemicals, it's not going to want to stick around because it's not healthy, right? Preemies, again, another reason I believe intuitively and my husband believes this because he was a preemie, he was dowsing in his mother's stress chemicals, he wanted out, so he was born premature, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I digress, right? So working with healthy aggression and anger isn't about just going in and like, okay, I'm going to be angry today. It's actually going back to, if you were here at the beginning of the talk, that neuroplastic healing sequencing. And one of those things is being able to follow our biology and our impulse. So I'm going to get into that for the next piece. And I'm going to go over here. I can see that there are a lot of comments in here. Um, okay, okay. Let's see, let's see. Yeah, Jessica says, it's like when they accidentally bite the nipple and they hear a harsh ouch reaction, watching their bodily reaction to that expression, they understand. Yeah, and, and you know, the interesting thing is um, when, a, when a female goes into nursing mode, technically, she should be going into a bit of what's called a dorsal freeze state, a low tone dorsal immobility state in a healthy way. She needs to be immobile so that that little one can get nourished without fuss. And so when a, when a female goes into that immobility state in a healthy way, it's not that she's numbing out, but there is a level of understanding that I am here to give and I'm not here to react, right? Um, if you've ever watched a, 
a cat or a dog, I mean, all the animals that have multiple, when they have big litters, and all those puppies or all those kittens are just latching on to all of the nipples, there's a lot of chomping going on there, right? Um, I grew up in a veterinary hospital, so I've seen it. And a good mother, cat or dog, isn't going to bark and harm their cubs, their little ones, if they get bit a little bit. They are literally laying there with just like, come take me and I will feed you. So yeah, that's a very good um, example there. Okay. Teresa says, is feeling hot on the face an expression of anger? Anybody know? It could be, it might not be. It could be the holding in of tears. It could be the holding in of expression. It could be, um, it could be the holding in of disgust. And again, this is where as you get to know me more and if you start to do the work with me, I don't have, you know, a list. There's no list here. I don't have a list of when you feel this, this is what that means. When you have this symptom, it must mean that. A lot of people say, oh, well, all jaw tension must be stored anger. No, maybe you have trauma from a dentist. Maybe you had braces when you were young and you still have tension in your jaw from that experience. That's what happened to me. Right, so it's very important to know that um, it doesn't have to be specific. It can be though, right? We think our blood is boiling, I must be angry, um, but it could be something else. And that's where, to go back to the topic, sovereign source energy, being able to learn and practice how to come into your system and track and really listen, not to, oh, I'm red in the face, I must be angry, I'm red in the face, let me feel that. Let me touch, what is this? What is it feeling like, et cetera, et cetera. Teresa says, in the old days, they would forceps a baby out. They still do. There's a lot of uh, devices that that are used and sometimes it might need to happen. Um, And then of course, nowadays we're doing way too many C-sections in my opinion, again. Marie says, can you say more about annihilation energy? Yeah, um, annihilation energy is kind of being able to own and accept and practice our sadistic energy. So I know that sounds really big, but the, the ability to really honor, I call it kill energy, but we are human beings and we are human animals. And so if someone has deeply harmed us, like threatened our life, has been physically abusive, sexually abusive, verbal or emotionally abusive. They they all register in the nervous system as the same for the most part. Um, There might be a desire in you, no matter what age, to kill that energy, to annihilate it because it has been so harmful to you. Getting to that level of being able to annihilate is higher, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a higher level of working with anger and healthy aggression. If someone has trouble sneezing in public, that's a weird example right now, but if someone has trouble, you know, sneezing in their own home or has trouble, um, you know, passing gas in the comfort of their own home, if they're um, embarrassed with their body functions and can't even be open with their biology, and I'm gonna get into this in a second, Um, we can't tap into that big, big anger annihilation energy. The work I've done with students where we're working with annihilation energy, there cannot be any part of the brain that feels bad about what they're imagining. This is all about imagination. There might be some movement um, with the hands, but it isn't, you're not going out and harming someone. And here's the thing, this is where violence comes in, guys and gals. Violence occurs usually because that individual has got so much stored up life force energy and they have no idea how to direct it. Remember when I talked about the Edgar Cayce's quote? Proper direction is key. When violence is put out and it's it doesn't do anything, it's just there and it's harming other people, things, etc. It's not useful, it's not productive. Um, So yes, you do not want to hurt others, but if you have been harmed, there is a very strong um, way that we can work with this 
with again the neuroplastic sequencing we need to have capacity on board we need we, we need to be able to be like here i am sitting in my living room and there's a seagull there and it's blue sky and i've got 85 people here and i've got two drinks in front of me i'm very aware of my environment i'm very aware of my breath i'm aware of the temperature of my hands i'm aware of the hair on my neck i can see the orange that i'm wearing my blue jeans my pelvis is moving if we don't have that level of awareness first and we try to go into this anger work we're not going to move it out in my opinion and from my experience in a way that actually will integrate so we need to do ground school if anybody's ever learned how to fly you don't just go into a plane on the first day I have learned how to fly, not planes, but paragliders. You don't go off that mountain on the first day. You have to learn the buckles, the process. You have to learn the, the, the wind, how, how all the things work before you even are given any pass to go and fly. So think of flying a plane or a paraglider wing or a glider like getting to this annihilation bigger, um, energy anger healthy aggression out we got to do the groundwork so that when we we do put that big energy out we got it because what happens and i've seen this who with people who are trying to force this healthy aggression annihilation energy out they want it so bad because they want to heal and they know that that stored stuff is keeping them unwell it's keeping them anxious it's keeping them whatever you want to be name the list of symptoms that we know is connected to stored anger and aggression they want it so bad that they bypass all the important steps and it's like the equivalent of going into a plane and then just crashing it and i have witnessed i have heard of people that have gone to these weekend workshops they try to get it all out in one go right and they come back with a lot more anxiety they come back with an autoimmune flare they come out and they break up with all their relationships and then they're left with nothing because they're on that high or they 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 um they collapse right collapse is a form of how our nervous system can't handle the intense energy and it goes nope and it it goes down okay i'm going to go into the next piece which is the biology and i wrote something last night and i'm going to just go to it because um i thought it was good so this comes back to this knowing that we have an innate knowing, knowing that we have in ourselves an innate knowing. But here's the thing. If we have been robbed of that, we might not even know that we can make our own choices. You actually see this, and you may know this, or you may be that person that does it. If you're watching two people having a conversation or you're listening to a podcast I catch this on a lot of podcasts and someone I'm gonna make it really basic you're at a comedy show I know we're not doing that right now but let's just say pretend you're at a comedy show the guy is really funny woman's really funny the person's really funny and everyone's laughing there will be if you watch and if you observe a few people in the audience who won't laugh until they look to make sure it's okay to laugh and then they laugh have you seen that or they'll be they'll, they'll just they'll, they won't have a spontaneous they'll hear the joke they think it's funny or they know it's funny but they suppress that energy they suppress that life force energy they're not being sovereign they're they're looking for acknowledgement they're looking for the tribe or the community or the others to say it's okay to laugh and so that that just that image just came into my mind so if we think about now i'm going to go back to the kid thing so i made the example with the baby healthy aggression let's say that now that little one is five and i talk about this in my functional freeze video but i won't get into that example so as a kid as a kid you have to believe that the external truth is accurate and yours is not so you're learning if you think about that three-year-old that four-year-old you're fresh you're not you haven't had life experience right and so you look to your your um 
parents, your caregivers, your babysitter, your daycare provider for, for what is correct and what is accurate. <clears throat> Otherwise, you stay in a state of active survival. So in other words, like let's just say um, little Susie is not um, feeling well, right? I'm going to make a real, exa real simple example. Let's say she's hungry. Let's say she's hungry. She's at home and she senses in her biology, in her belly, hunger. It's a pretty accurate thing. If you go back to the baby example, when baby is hungry, usually baby cries. And we know if they're hungry because then when they're given a bottle or the nipple, they settle and then they're fine. Animals, when they're hungry, if you've been around kittens and puppies, they're, they're wailing, they find the bottle, they find the tit, they, they suckle, they soothe, and then they fall asleep. You wouldn't again, you, you, I hope, you wouldn't say to that little kitten or that baby, you're crying, I'm not going to feed you. Of course we know that people leave babies to cry it out and that it's terrible or they, they feed, train, feed train them, I forget what that's called. They train them to eat at certain times. But you wouldn't deny an innocent little child or an innocent animal their food if they're hungry. So if we think about the two-year-old that now can talk, they can ask for food, they can ask for a snack. Um, and then we say to them, you're not hungry. Or it's not dinner time yet, you'll be fine, wait. Now, of course, if dinner's in five minutes, that's different. But if it's like an hour and a half away and you are depriving that little one of something simple like, you know, a carrot or a banana, or something that, you know, it's not about healthy, non-healthy, just give them some food that's just normal. Let that hunger be satisfied. But so often, and this is just one example, again, one example, that innate knowing of I'm hungry, I need something to eat, if it's not met, that little one starts to stop listening to that innate stuff, right? So it could be hunger, it could be temperature, right? Put on your jacket, I'm not cold. And sometimes this becomes a power struggle. But you know, if a baby's overheating and you don't notice it, their, their temperature regulation is all over the place. So, okay, I'm not gonna go down that route. We'll leave temperature regulation out of today. So um, to go back to this thing, if, if that is not respected, the hunger, the emotion, I'm scared, there's a monster in my closet. No, there's not. Monsters don't exist, right? Sure, there might not be a monster in the closet. But there is a fear in that little one. And often that little one is afraid because they don't want to be in their room alone, right? How many of us were like, mommy, mommy, there's a monster in my closet. Something's under my bed. We're in a room by ourselves. We ask them to come in, not necessarily in my thought because we know there's a monster there, but we're feeling fear. We're afraid because we're alone, but we have to disguise it as monster in the closet, as opposed to, I don't want to be alone. Can I come in with you? Or can you sleep with me? Or can you be in my room until I fall asleep? Again, if that fear response is met with a, you're not afraid, there's no monsters, be, you'll fine, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, don't worry. But if it's not addressed, we're not teaching that little human how to acknowledge their inner knowing, right? Their inner innate sense. They're losing, as someone said here, this is how we lose our instincts. And it's really simple when we really put it into that simple context. So back to what I wrote, if there's no respect and allowance of who you are, you start to shut down. Not only your biological cues, not only your bio biological cues, but also the fight and flight responses. So we go into that freeze state, which is on the spectrum of nervous system activation. If I realize I'm not going to get addressed, this information that I'm feeling in my body isn't going to get acknowledged, and it's still coming, and it's still coming, I, as a human animal, I'm going to shut it down and then we store it. So let's just say little Susie is really pissed at mom because she doesn't 
acknowledge the monster and she's not going to look under the bed and look under the closet and look in all the drawers and she's mad but she knows if she gets mad she might get punished so she's going to hold in that mad and not really know where it goes because she's too young she's not going to wake up the next morning and go okay i better work on my anger today and i better get um uh some music to help it's not going to happen right those kids are so malleable that they have to find a way to survive in a context that isn't allowing them to be their true sovereign sense, self, life force energy. Okay, I wrote that last night. I was like, wanted to read that because um, this, is, this is super complex, but it's also super simple when we look at it in these very basic examples. Now, I just gave some very, we could say more benign examples but the kid who is being beaten, the child that is being molested, raped, the child that has got medical appointments every week because they have leukemia and they have to be poked and prod and they don't want to, They're, they are finding ways to go into their own shutdown because they can't fight. They're too little to fight. They can't run out of the hospital room and run down the road and go you know, camp with the crows in the park. They have to stay there and be treated. So um, where was I going with that? Biology. So, and by the way, the monsters in the closet thing, that's real, right? So if you've ever um, worked with kids, and one of my teachers, Steve Terrell, I did an interview with him. It's a great interview. We can pop it up. Um, he works primarily with kids who were adopted or adults who were adopted or the parents who have adopted children, lots of early developmental problems. And when you have a, um, a child who has been adopted or an adult who was adopted and now you're an adult and you're healing your early trauma, even if you were put into an adoptive home that was so loving and nurturing and actually let you eat when you were hungry, there will be an imprint of something's not safe. Mama wasn't happy and she had to leave me, right? She had to give me to someone else. That's a deep imprint. And so, you know, one of his things he said to me in this interview was have the kid, and of course this has to be a kid that's a little older, go around with them at night and you look in all the drawers. You make sure all the doors are locked. It's not about being paranoid. It's not that this will be something that continues, but you have to give that nervous system the knowing that the environment is safe. Look under uh, the blankets, open the drawers, that, oh, just socks, open the cupboards, oh, just toothpaste, whatever, right? And actually allowing that little one to see there's nothing there, but we went to the motions of checking is deeply, deeply healing. And for some of us as adults, we might need to do that too. And there's no shame in that, right? But if we aren't doing it, if we're staying frantic, um, it will cause us to stay in that survival state. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up soon here. This idea of sovereign source energy, to me, it's very biological. Most of it is biological. When we can really connect to that inner sensation when we can start to be with our biologies in the way that we were maybe not taught to or we weren't allowed to when we were young you will be amazed at how much starts to grow and rewire i have heard from my students and i've experienced this myself the more we connect to that biology and really acknowledge it and honor it and not put um, labels, I'm, this is happening, therefore this must be the case, we start to become able to be fully human. And I said at the beginning, I'll repeat it, humans aren't just animals, we're not just mammalian, we have these, these emotions and sensations and guts that work like, you know, the primates and the squirrels and all that, but we also have this higher brain and we've got this other technology called consciousness that allows us to observe our biology, right? It allows us to observe the fear response and be with the fear, but not fear the fear response. I'll say that one more time. Um, to be with the fear, to be with the panic, to be with the sensation, but not fear that that we feel. 
this is not just something that we figure out in one week. Trust me. I've been teaching this stuff for a long time with success and the more capacity we grow, the more we connect with the environment, with our life's purpose, which I feel this is mine, the more opportunity to dive into deeper and deeper trauma levels, more of that shadow side, more of the dark side, and then we're given you know, a stadium full of stuff that we didn't even know still existed in our system. But the difference when we get to those higher levels of mastery, which I hope all of you want, is that we take it like a boss. We're like, oh, okay, I just found myself going into a little bit of a fear of the fear. Nope, I'm gonna stay right here. I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move my system. True story, last night I was feeling something in my system. I won't go into details. And again, this is where if I had a script, when I feel this sensation, I do this. I don't do that anymore. I felt this sensation and I found myself wanting to go into a habit. I'm like, no, what, do I, what, what does my body want to do? And I started to march in my living room. Literally, I started to march on the spot like a soldier. And I got my hands swinging and I started to speak words that made no sense. They were English words, but I just went with whatever kept coming and coming and I didn't question it. Kind of like if we have a little one who's crying in a puddle because they just scraped their knee, we're not gonna tell them, okay, first you're gonna do this little one and then you're gonna do this and then we're gonna blow your nose and then I'm gonna give you a hug. Doesn't work that way, right? So when we think about us as adults, working through a difficult sensation, working through a difficult emotion, through a fear, through our versions of the monsters in the closet, we wanna to get to a point, this sovereign source energy where we're not being guided by something on the outside that told us this is what you do when this happens. And that takes great trust, big fucking trust, part of my language, but not really, right? It's big trust to follow that and so I started marching. My husband came up stairs. And because we're on the same page, and I actually had a note to mention relationships, so this is my cue to do that. I was in my living room. I'll be really descript. I had pants on. I didn't have a shirt on. I had just gotten out of a bath. And I was marching, and he came up to make himself a piece of toast. He was doing his thing. I'm doing my thing. I didn't stop what I was doing. I just spouted out this song that was words and made no sense and I just put it out and I started flailing my arms and then some screams came out and then some expression came out and I kept marching and it was like for 10 minutes and I, it was like an aerobic activity at 11 o'clock at night and I just let it come through and I let it come through and then I let it stop when my body said no more. I didn't stop because he came upstairs. I didn't stop because, oh, it's too late at night. I shouldn't do this. I let my system play it out. And here's the thing. If we are in a relationship that won't accept and acknowledge that wildness of sovereign energy, we got a problem. Because if he had come up and I was feeling this uh, bubbling of God knows what it was and I don't know what it was I wasn't gonna label it and I stop I'm like oh so he's here okay I'll go make a piece of toast too I don't want a piece of toast I wanted to march on spot and, and say this weird singing thing that made no sense right and so we have to have a real conversation with ourselves if we are living in an environment where that is not being allowed now of course if you're living in a home with kids and all this stuff it, you know, you got to find out where to go with that because you don't want to frighten your children. You don't want to keep them up at night because you need to march on the spot and scream a song. So I have the beauty of being in a space with a supportive person who gets it and we don't have little children. Um, but is there a way to be creative with those moments? Can you walk outside? Anyway, wanted to share that because that happened last night. True story. And it wasn't something that I could video record because it would have taken me out of the moment, right? Um, and I wasn't wearing a shirt, so that wouldn't be PC. Um, but our relationships are super important, guys. We need to have safety within them because a lot of the stuff we're processing that isn't allowing us to have sovereign source energy is because of the unsafety in our relationships before. 
And so we're in this, we can be in a bind if we know we don't have it. Um, let me just go back to my notes to make sure I haven't missed anything. But that story I just gave you, you know, don't now go and start marching on your spot. Don't take your shirt off and, and hope that your husband comes up making a piece of toast and you practice being your, that's not, I didn't share that so that you replicate it. You've got to find how you need to move that out. And it could be something simple, like it could be something super simple or it could be something super different. It could be getting up pens and papers and crayons and starting to draw like a crazy five-year-old that's in art therapy, right? It might be walking outside and howling at the moon because you finally had a, des a desire to make some sound and that's your entry point into expressing yourself. There's, this is, I, am I getting through? I hope I am. We know that that is there. And someone just th said, I think indigenous communities have knowledge on this. Yes, they do. This is shamanic work. This is what shamanic work is. It's following that source, that thread that is in us. It's not on the outside necessarily. It's through us and up and out. Okay, so I covered the importance of anger and healthy aggression. I covered why it's important to get the groundwork on board first, right? Don't want to get into a plane on the first day of flight school. We want to learn the basics first. I talked about this innate knowing that we all have, but how it gets stopped so early because of culture and the breeding of, you know, you got to be this way and this way. And I, I think in society, we do need to have civility and some personality to keep things in check. But at the same time, we need to start acknowledging this uniqueness in the human system. We're not just animals and we're not just human. We're both. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. The last note I have down here is personal practice. Personal practice. We, we need to practice. And um, how do I say this? I know some of you are my students. Some of you might be thinking about doing some of my programs. And some of you might never. And that's fine. But here's the thing that I see people get into a trap with. So I'm going to state it. If we treat this work like something that we do only on Saturdays at 4 p.m. because that's when things aren't chaotic and it's quiet, it's, it's going to be hard. Doesn't mean you can't practice on 4 p.m. because that's your time to have solo time. But we need to find a way to practice this work all the time. So as you've been listening to this, some of you are listening on your computer, tablet, cell phone, you might be listening to this in your car. Have you been noticing your feet? Have you even felt your body as I've been talking? Have you been so glued to the screen that your jaw is tight and your hands, you don't even know where they are? Um, so part of this work is living it and integrating it with life all the time. And I see a lot of my students get into this, um, uh, get into trouble where their lives get really busy and they can't have quiet time and they're like, I'm not doing the work because I'm not with my computer listening to Irene's lessons or doing the coursework. And I want you to do the coursework if you do my courses. I want you to sit down and be a student and have time. But on the same token, we have to start, once we've done a little bit and enough, we have to start practicing. We have to start integrating it when we're driving, when we're walking, when we're doing the dishes, when we're scrubbing the toilet, when we're walking our dog, when we're at the grocery store checking out and, and feeling our feet on the ground. I mean, there's the opportunity to practice is always there. And if we don't know how to practice, we have to learn those ground skills. So very, very important. Um, I had a thought come through and now it's gone, but that's okay. <laughs> Someone said, society needs to be rewritten. It does and it doesn't. I think we need to just create something new. We can't rewrite what's already occurred. I think history is very important. 
we erase everything that's happened before us, then we won't know where we came from, right? If I couldn't tell you stories about babies being left to cry themselves to sleep and little Susie not being able to cry when she falls off of her bike and how babies are taken at a moment and they're immediately put in blankets and not put skin to skin. If we don't know those past things that have occurred, then we can't use them as lessons to teach the future. It's very important to understand that. Um, I know there might be some questions here. Um, I'm very conscious of our time. We've gone way over an hour, um, but it's, I hope you see that this is complex and simple at the same time. Um, Shelby says, how do you not let your anger hurt others? My anger is so strong that I've been an abusive in the past and my rage scares me. The energy is so strong it's hard to contain. So Shelby, this is a great question. It's what I said earlier. You got to learn the groundwork. If I use the example of flying a plane, don't go fly the plane right now. Or if you feel that you got to fly that plane, don't be with other people when you let that rip. But practice, if you can, get into my programs, learn how to titrate sensation, learn how to start to express little bits of energy so that your system knows how to contain it. It's exactly what I read in that Edgar Casey quote. We need to be able to control it, but also express it. We don't want to control it and suppress it. We want to control it and express it so that it isn't harming others or ourselves, right? Self-harm is a big thing. And we will often, you know, all of the ways that we self-harm ourselves, whether with food or drugs or bad behavior or risky relationships or, um, you know, it's sadly a big thing with kiddos now is cutting themselves. You know, that is a way to express intensity without harming someone else. Let's just harm myself, right? We need to stop that. We need to get out of that paradigm. Um, okay. All right, I have no doubt there are a few questions up there. I'm gonna leave them for now. It's not because I'm not uh, wanting to answer them, but I wanna bring this to a close. I'm gonna bring it to a close with a, another quote, said Edgar Casey day to day. Let's see, this comes back to practice. And um, just a quick note, I do these lectures once a month. I'll do another one in February. Don't know what the topic will be. Uh, if you have a topic that you're interested in, let me know. We have a lot of special topic lectures from last year. This year in 2021, I'm trying to not repeat things. I don't want to reinvent the wheel um, because of my energy and my time and I wanna create new things and, and do other things that can feed the collective this information. As I mentioned, if you haven't yet started with my healing trauma series, start with that. People always are like, how do I start? How do I start? Start with the healing trauma series if you're watching this around now, around the 21st of January, um, get into the 21 day tune up, the 21 day nervous system tune up. That's my self study starter course. And then when we open up registration in February, February 22nd for Smart Body, Smart Mind, get into Smart Body, Smart Mind. It is an investment. It is a very powerful program. Read and listen to the students who have gone through this people from all around the world, all walks of life, all sorts of different histories and pasts, all that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, of course I can't, I, now I have to answer this question. Helen asks, can you speak about transgenerational trauma, transgenerational trauma? I'm gonna just give a little plug for that. Basically intergenerational, transgenerational trauma, it's real, we know it's real. The work is the same, the work is the same. In other words, if someone comes to me, I'm not going to say, because you have this kind of trauma, we're going to do this differently. If I look at this SBSM curriculum, we're not putting people into separate groups because they want to work on chronic pain or sexual uh, trauma or religious trauma or in utero trauma or past life trauma or intergenerational trauma. We're all going through the curriculum in the same way I'll re review that concept of neuroplastic healing sequencing. We have to start with the groundwork. So someone might learn a little more about how intergenerational trauma gets passed down through the cells and the nervous system. But to be honest, it's, it's the same thing. 
because now in this moment at 1 26 p.m pacific time on january 21st 2021 um, this is the here and now as far as we know it everything that occurred before me within my system within my ancestry has happened and it's happening now and so we need to work on the now we can have an observational quality of past we can dive into the history and some of us don't know our history maybe our family is all deceased and there were no records but we have a feeling we have a feeling that something occurred it's like that example i gave where i was marching in my living room last night i don't know if that was because of something that happened that day or if it was in utero stuff or it was past stuff or it was a past life thing i didn't even question it and so what i'm seeing and this will be how i hopefully <laughs> close for today bear with me here um is to see the work as the work and we've gotten really kind of glamorized in a way of oh this is this kind of trauma and this is this kind of and yes those are all very important but at the end of the day the nervous system is the nervous system the biology is the biology and the human brain is the human brain we have wires in us and histories and complexities that are all different but if we were to try to write a specific program for every single kind of trauma and every single kind of uh, variation of that we would not get anything done and so i say that with pure sincerity it's important if you're interested in it look at look into it look into the research um, but then the practice is all the same. So I'm gonna end with a quote on practice. So this is another Edgar Cayce quote from the same book, I think. Um, so success depends on our willingness to actually practice the teachings. Soul growth is possible only through application. So success depends on our willingness to actually practice the teachings. Soul growth, so that sovereign source energy life force growth it's only possible through application. So if you choose and you just, and you enter into my practices, my programs, you gotta do the work. Just purchasing and showing up here and there won't do the full work. This is learning a new language. It's practicing a new language over and over again. And it gets a lot easier. It gets a lot easier, but that beginning can always feel a little tough because you're literally starting the engine when the engine's maybe never even been played before or been turned on. You need to replace the fluids, the oil's dirty, you gotta do all the things, gotta do all these things, right, to get it going. But once you get some of the basics on board, things start to pop quite quickly and in ways that are fascinating. So thank you for being here. This has been a long one. We've been going for just over um, almost 90 minutes. You're welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for listening. If you were here after the fact, watching the replay, if you're watching the YouTube replay, thanks for hanging out. And um, we'll be back for another one in February. And drop-in class is this Saturday. And like I said, we only run SBSM once a year. So um, get into there, into the program site, learn about it, get on the wait list so that you don't miss any of our announcements. All right, we'll talk to you later. And bye for now.